through the Bibles, through our readings, through all this other stuff. So there's a little part of me that I really, really kind of missed being up here. Um, on top of that, this is also kind of like my favorite time of the year. Like there's just something great about like, you know, right about that New Year's Eve, right leading into the new year, that I always feel that it's a great time to kind of reflect on the past year. Because if you guys are like me, like in 2019, you know, New Year's Eve especially, um, a little bit on New Year's Day, where I start to look back at some of like the wins of 2019. Some of the things that went really, really well. Um, some of the losses. I'm sure that we, I'm not the only one to say that I have some big mistakes in 2019. To go back and kind of rethink about those things and figure, you know, how could I have avoided that or kind of gotten away from that. To go back and to analyze the time of struggle that we had in 2019. Um, the struggle might look different from the beginning towards the end. You know, it could be more challenging at times, maybe even less challenging. But it always leaves me very optimistic with um, the coming year. And honestly, I feel like, you know, I have a very, very good feeling of 2020. And even for me, someone just recently asked me, <clears throat> they say, hey, what are your New Year's resolutions? And I just, I said, I don't make them. I just, I just don't, I don't believe in them. Um, I, <coughs> um, because ultimately, I feel that we all come out with these New Year's resolutions just to kind of give up on them shortly thereafter. And I said, it's much easier for me just to not even have them <clears throat> than to be disappointed <laughs> shortly thereafter. But I would say over the last week or so, God's been giving me like this very clear message. And I, for me, I personally, I'm a little bit like challenged where God's got to send me the same message a number of times before I actually kind of acknowledge it. And he started sending me this really reoccurring message, right? The first thing that happened um, was my son Elijah, who's my second one, he's my 10-year-old broke his glasses. And he broke the glasses right where the plastic meets like the metal hinge. So like when he broke it, he gave it to me and I was like, oh, that's easy, I'm just gonna glue it. Well, lo and behold, it's very difficult to glue like plastic to like metal. And I was at Home Depot and like four glues later, I finally found one that I think might work just long enough to get us a new pair of glasses. Um, but it's just funny because he's just been complaining like, dad, I can't see. Dad, I don't know what's in front of me. Dad, please try to fix my glasses, All right? And as, that, as if that message wasn't loud enough, um, personally, I got LASIK about, I would say, maybe 13, 14 years ago. And my vision now is totally tar starting to kill me. And I feel like, especially over like the last week or two, like, and even when we were doing the series with Abuna and we were having like to read off the screen, like my eyes were just killing me. And it just started kind of setting in for me, right? Because then I'm starting to think about the fact that I, I hate New Year's resolutions. I don't like committing to these things. Um, and I guess I started to really think about it. And my fear is I do not want to have a 2020 where I just kind of stroll through it with no mission and no purpose. And I felt what God was kind of telling me was, you know, whatever you do, don't go through this year with no vision, right? Don't go through this year without seeing clearly about what you want to accomplish. And there's two topics that I really love that, that kind of relate to this quote. The first one was, our greatest fear should not be a failure. Because I know that we're all terrified of that. Like our greatest fear should not be a failure, but it should be at succeeding at things in life that really don't matter. It should be of succeeding at things in life that really just don't matter. And that might describe some of our 2019s, right? And then the other quote was, if you're shooting for nothing, you hit it every single time. Maybe that was your 2019. Um, so the side note, I want to take a little poll real quick before I dump to this. Um, raise your hand if you prefer Old Testament. Raise your hand if you prefer the New Testament. Okay, I, I was really worried, guys, because <laughs> I thought no one was going to raise their hand for New Testament either. <laughs> and then we're just going to be all not about anything. Um, so that's a common like, kind of discussion that me and Christina have at the house, right? Because Christina's always been a little bit more about the New Testament. I've always kind of really enjoyed the Old Testament. And the reason that I enjoy the Old Testament is what does the Old Testament have? The Old Testament has stories, right? It's got personalities, real people, real lives, real mistakes, and where God meets them in their brokenness. Like you look at these great Old Testament characters, 
And, you know, it's like that great saying, it says, God doesn't call, call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Like you see that throughout the Old Testament, because there's characters here where you're like, God, I don't know why you chose that person, right? But it's a reminder to me that he can even show up there. And one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible, or it's really a couple of them, is First and Second Samuel. Now, trivia question, who is like, First and, and Second Samuel majorly about like who's like the major theme that kind of runs through those books? I know you want to say Samuel, but that's not that's not. So anyone? This, this guy's a big deal, like in the Old Testament. Like if you had to just throw out a name in the Old Testament, <laughs> David. Yes, you were close. It's it. Solomon was in his lineage, so technically, <laughs> but it's King David, right? Um, and specifically, one of the things I love about this is I love the feud you see between King Saul and King David. And it doesn't get any more real than that. It's so much that we can relate to. Because uh, you see, because First Samuel is kind of like the foundation of King David's story, right? It, he started, we started talking about humble beginnings and where he started, right? And how he was so humble and such a great leader. And not only was he a great military leader, but he was a great spiritual leader as well. You know, second... Samuel, um, things kind of take a turn. We see a side of King David that no one expected, right? Because in first, in, in first Samuel, he's referred to as a man after God's own heart. So when you read that, you're like, man, King David, that's whew, right? But then things progress. And now we've gone to the point in King David's life where he was a great military leader, he was a great spiritual leader, he, you know, very humble, very this and very that. But now whenever we say the name of King David, what does everybody know about him? Who else's name does everybody associate with King David? Bathsheba, right? Um, <clears throat> how did a man after God's own heart turn into an adulterer and a murderer? And that's the thing, like, how do you fall that far, that quickly? Well, I'll tell you, it reminds me of a story back in my childhood. Um, when I was young, I remember uh, when I was in elementary school, they'd all take us to the gym, and they'd line us up in different lines, and we would take a vision test. And I remember specifically, it was second grade, and we were all going through the vision test like we always kind of do. And I went and I did my test, and they said, Peter, can you go stand in that line? And I'm like, but all my friends are in that line. <laughs> They're like, I know, but we need you to go stand in that line. Um, and that's when I first started to learn that my vision was going bad, right? I started to have this lack of vision. Um, and I remember, you know, time over time, it got worse and worse, and my glasses got thicker and thicker. Um, and then it was a gradual process, right? Like I went from being like a normal kid to being like a really, really dorky kid with like really thick glasses. And I didn't even realize what was happening because it was so gradual. Um, and I don't think a lot of us realize how important our vision is to us. You know, it allows us to see things that are close to us. It gives us the ability to see things that are still, that are still like quite a ways away, it gives us distance. It helps us communicate with other people. Like one of the things that I noticed with Elijah when he didn't have his glasses because they were broken and I would be giving him a sarcastic look, he totally wouldn't pick up on my body language. You know, like vision is like that important. And unfortunately, we don't realize how important our, our vision is until we start seeing the consequence of not having it. See, because vision's crazy. Um, did you know that, yeah, you have people that need glasses, right? But do you also know that there's something called selective blindness? Selective blindness, you know, is something that, like, did you ever realize that you can't proofread your own papers? Like, if I type out an email, like, I usually give it to somebody else and say, hey, can you review this? Because I think it looks great, right? And then I always get it back, and it's all typed up, like, you forgot this comma, this word is misspelled, you don't have an apostrophe here, um, because we need another set of eyes to kind of check our work. And it's because we tend to see what we want to see, don't we? Like typing an email is just a small example of that. But we tend to see what we want to see. We don't really realize that we're losing our vision. And I think a lot of that have that in our personal lives. Because there's a lot of times, or we all have that person in our life that we know, right, that is really, really good at pointing out whatever's wrong in someone else's life. 
but they are completely clueless to what's going on in their own life. Like their life can be a complete mess and they're completely oblivious to it, but they're really good at nitpicking someone else's life, right? They're quick to focus on the flaw of others, but they have a ton of justifications for their own life. Well, do you know who that person is in my life? It's me. It's me. And I'll be honest with you. Do you know who that person is in your life? It's you. (laughs) It's you. You know, because when Christ wrote this, he convicted every single one of us. He says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look at a plank that's a while and look while you still have a plank in your own eye? See, and, and it's funny because, and I know that when I read that in the Gospels, and I read that, I always say, oh, dude, that's so, that is so, so and so, right? Like, I know, I know who he's talking about. But let's not make any mistake about it. When we are reading the Bible, who are we reading it for? Ourselves. So when I read that, who's God talking to? He's talking to Peter. He's not saying, hey, Peter, I need you to talk to so-and-so about this. He said, no, this is for you. And it's, it really is for every single one of us. See, because you see, King David was a good king, right? And in 1 Kings 15, 5, I, I love what it's written about him. He says, David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life. Can you imagine that? See, King David did everything. You know, he did everything that was right in the eyes of God. He did not turn aside from anything and all that he commanded him in all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So what was the matter of Uriah the Hittite? In reality, it was the matter of Bathsheba. See, because Uriah was a good man. He was a man of virtue. You know, in the Bible, you know, you read Uriah's story and you're just like, man, this was a good guy, right? I would even say that this, this, this could have been one of David's right-hand men. He was that faithful and that dependable. But that's not the way that David treated, treated him. Because you see, David, you know, David looked at Uriah and Uriah had something that David wanted, right? He wanted something of Uriah and he took it. And then after he took it, he killed him. Because Uriah was Bathsheba's husband. And how how did the man who was righteous before God, and if we look at that, how did the man who, who found himself in the same cave as Saul, who was pursuing him for his life, that he was on the run from, you know, and he found him, and he could have killed him, didn't touch him even though many people would have said he would have been completely and utterly justified. How did that man who had such a respect for the life of Saul have such a disrespect or a lack of caring for the life of Uriah? You know, to kill his own faithful and loyal servant. And when I think of that story, I say, King David here, he was just, he was losing his vision. He wasn't seeing clearly. You know, and I remember in, you know, if you go back to my second grade experience, and I remember when they told me I needed glasses, I was floored. I was like, dude, I don't need glasses. I can see perfectly, right? I didn't believe them, right? I didn't even notice that I was losing my vision. Honestly, every single year after that, when I would go to my eye doctor and the eye doctor would kind of sit me up, I remember I would walk in and I would have this attitude like, doctor, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, I think my eyes have totally stabilized out. I don't need new glasses. I can see just fine. And every year I was wrong. And I was shocked when they would go and they would give me a stronger prescription. And it wouldn't make sense until when? Until I put them on. And I'm like, wow, is this what I've been missing? This is phenomenal. (laughs) So I remember when I was 18, I got a job at Bank of America. And I remember I was a teller. And I remember one of the weird things was at Bank of America, they had something called like your, uh, your daily limit of being out of balance. So at, at Bank of America, your cash drawer could be out of balance, $25, and it goes completely like unrecorded. And that sounds like a lot of money. Like I remember when I worked at Wells, it was three bucks, right? <laughs> like, not a lot of margin of error, right? But 25 bucks at Bank of America. And I remember my, uh, my, my first day there, you know, we were, we were working, or it wasn't my first day, it was my first Saturday there. 
and the girl next to me was just like, oh, um, yeah, every Saturday I just, I pay for, uh, I pay for my lunch for my cash store. And I was just like, look, I know I'm new here, but I am pretty sure that that's wrong. Right. But, and I just remember, she's like, oh, what's the big deal? It's five bucks or a lot, 25, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I remember, um, so I would see five, uh, she would take five here, 10 there, you know, kind of whatever. But I remember that I was there for a year. And I remember by the end of the year, she found a way to be like basically skimming 80 to hundred dollars a shift off of her cash drawer. And I look back at that and I say, you know what was going on with her? She was losing her vision, right? What started off as, eh, and then it got blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. And then she found herself doing things, you know, her sin was escalating and she didn't even see it, right? And she just justified it because, you know, she felt underpaid, she felt undervalued, she felt that she was worth so much more, and her vision was getting worse and worse and worse. And I wonder right now, in this room right now, is that, is any of that happening to us right now? Are there areas of our life where we're making compromise after compromise after compromise, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we don't even realize it? Because if you look back at the life of King David, before his big run of sin, um, I think his life was going rather well, right? You know, his kingdom was growing. He had a great army. They were leaders. Um, but we see a couple issues that kind of crept in at that time that I believed that helped everything kind of fall apart. Because I don't think that this is something that happened with King David all at once. It was one bad decision, although... Like, I, one of the things I always say is each one of us is one bad decision away from ruining the rest of our lives. But I think that for King David here, it was more than one bad decision. I think it was a progression of bad decisions. See, because the first thing in 2 Samuel 11, 1, it says, you know, it happened in the spring of the year. At the time when kings go out to battle, what do kings do at that time? They go out to battle, right? That's, that's what they do. That David sent Joab, his servant, with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and they besieged Rabbah, and David remained at Jerusalem. See, because David got lazy, right? He got lazy. He didn't go out to war. That was his thing, right? Not only was it his king, uh, his thing, every other king, it was their thing. Because it said at the time when the kings went out to war, but he, he decided, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I don't feel like it. Right? Even though this, is, this was such a source of blessing in his life. If you look at how he came on the scene and how he accomplished everything that he accomplished, it was because he was a great military leader. But he got away from that. Right? It's what he did. He was a warrior. You know, there was work to do. He just didn't want to go. He didn't want to do it. And he just sent somebody else to do it. And ironically, they were still successful. Right? They still destroyed everything. The nation of Israel still destroyed everything that needed to be destroyed. But who lost here? David. Because when we have a God-given responsibility and a God-given role, he's expecting us to do it. So I'm going to tell you, God created us for a reason. Every single one of us here, every single one of us, he has gifts and talents that he's entrusted us with. And if, he's not, if we are not using them, you're probably losing your vision. That's what happened here with David. He stopped doing what God called him to do, and he was losing his vision and his purpose. And on another side, of that, I'm going to tell you, don't ever think that if you decide not to do what God's called you to do, that God's not going to get somebody else to do it. He will, because the nation of Israel was still victorious. David was the one that was a loser in this situation. I'm going to tell you, every single one of us here, God's plan will go on. But if we don't jump on board and we don't do what God's entrusted us to do, who loses? I do. So while they're out on their trip and while they're out doing their own thing um, and they're winning their wars and King David's sitting at home, it is at that point where he is where he is not supposed to be that he notices his warrior's wife bathing. He invites her over. He does what he does. He tries to cover it up, ends up killing her husband, and it all snowballs. It all snowballs. And I always tell, like, I wish I knew King David's thought process right now, right? Like, was he actually realizing what he was doing? Was he realizing the way that this was escalating? 
Because I think a lot of the times we don't, we don't just take a step back to realize what is going on here. What he's doing is he's just taking a small step, small step, small step, small step. You know, it's not like when, you know, he found out things were going wrong. He just said, I'm going, well, I'll kill him. It was just a small progression. And I feel like I look at the darkest areas of my life, and I challenge you to examine the darkest areas of your life too. Wasn't it just a progression? One small step at a time. Deeper and darker, deeper and darker. Because that is exactly how our vision starts slipping away. It reminds me of a friend I grew up with. See, um, this buddy of mine, he had the worst eyesight I had ever seen from a guy who didn't wear glasses or had glasses but chose not to wear them. Okay, it was horrible. And what was even horrible is when we said we were going somewhere and he wanted to drive because of where the, this is back before GPS and navigation and all that. So when your car kind of tells you when to turn, but I still remember, I'm like, Hey man, like where, what do we need to turn on? Oh, we need to turn on Kalima. Right. And we're just like driving. And he doesn't realize it's Kalima until his car is like passing underneath <laughs> like the sign of it. Cause that's how close it needs to be for him to read it. And, and when he read a piece of paper, like the piece of paper literally had to be like touching his nose for him to be able to kind of read it. Um, and everyone knew, like, dude, you need your glasses, right? Like, he, everyone knew. And he was just in, in denial. And his sense of denial of his lack of vision, honestly, it just made him look silly. And I feel that that's me more often than I like to admit. And I challenge you that maybe it's not just me, but maybe it's you as well. Because we do... You know, we think we do such a good job covering our weaknesses. You know, letting people think, oh, well, they're never going to know this about me, right? Well, I do a really good job covering this up. But in reality, who are we kidding? We attempt to cover up what everyone else sees about us so clearly. And God sent David a very clear wake-up sign. You know, that night with Bathsheba prompted a second visit. And the second visit was when she came back to him and she says, hey, I'm pregnant. And you would think that that's a wake-up sign for him to say, oh, my God, fall on your knees and repent. And basically say, God, how did I do this? But unfortunately, it, did not, it was not enough to wake up David's conscience. Instead, he did what every single one of us does. He attempted to cover it up. He brought back Uriah from war. You know, he tried to get him even drunk so he can go home and sleep with his wife so he can blame the pregnancy on Uriah and Uriah can raise that kid. But Uriah was too loyal. He was too loyal for King David because when David's doing all this, trying to get him drunk, and he basically says, dude, go home to your wife. He says, how can I go back and lie with my wife when the ark and all of my brothers are out in an open field at war? So I'm telling you, David here, no vision. No vision about right, no vision about wrong, taking matters into his own hands, making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Uriah, perfect vision. He knew what he was about. He knew his purpose. He knew his role. He knew what was important to him. And he knew what he was working for because he had goals. You know, and David, unfortunately, King David had become completely numb. And that was not enough of a wake-up call. He had Uriah put on the front lines. He basically planned his death. Here's, you want to know a mind-blowing blow, story? He sends Uriah with a letter. And he says, hey, I need you to give this to the, command, to the commander-in-chief once you get there. So Uriah is carrying his own death wish. Goes and he takes it to the commander-in-chief. The commander-in-chief reads it and says, send Uriah to the very front when it's the hottest in battle. Like, like send him to the very front. And then pull everybody else back. And the faithful servant who carried that letter with enough reverence for his king that they didn't even open it was killed on the battle lines like that. And that didn't wake up David either. You know, I wonder if some of us right now, God is nudging at our hearts. God's trying to do things. He's trying to send us messages. He's trying to do all of this stuff right now. You know, he's trying to wake us up. Right? So a lot of us might even right now in this time of year, we'll be reevaluating our 2019. Right? We're thinking back and we'll, there's going to be aspects of our life. We say, how did I get there? How did I get there? How did I allow the sin to grow that much? Right? Like how did, how did I lose that much of my vision 
and not even realize it. So what's going on in your life right now that God might just be yelling at you and saying, dude, enough, enough. I don't want this to continue anymore. It could be a relationship that you're in right now that's just not good. You know, it could be a relationship that might be growing into something outside of your marriage that might not be good. You know, it could be substances, it could be pills, it could be something you're smoking, it could be something you're taking, it could be lust, it could be pure laziness. Because I'll tell you, no matter how long I make that list, I will, it will never be complete. Because there's one thing that we know, and that Satan is the deceiver. And he deceives all of us repeatedly, and he's really, really good at it. Because attacks from Satan are real, and they're all over the place, and he is successful. But God will wake you up. I guarantee you this. Everything that's hidden will be exposed one day. And I think that's something that we don't want to come to terms with. We hate to admit that because we think that we've done really, really good at covering up. Right? But I promise you that everything exposed will, everything will be exposed. And the hard part is when it's exposed, there's two things that you have no control over. Because it will be exposed. The first one is we have no control over when it will happen. We have no idea when God will expose our sin. The second thing is, is we have no control over whatever that consequence is. We have no control over that. The way that God wakes, wakes up King David is one of the reasons that I wanted to name my firstborn son Nathan. It's a beautiful story, right? So he sends a prophet Nathan to go tell him a story. And he tells the story, right? So Nathan shows up and he tells King David, listen to this. There's a wealthy guy. The wealthy guy has everything. He's got livestock. He's got everything you could ever, ever want it. But then he's got a neighbor. And the neighbor is a poor man. And the life, you know, and he's only got one thing. He's only got one piece of livestock. And it's this little lamb. And this lamb wasn't livestock to him. It was like, it was like one of his kids. It grew up with his kids. It ate with his food. It drank from his cup. And it slept in his arms. And the wealthy guy had a visitor. And he wanted to do something for the visitor, but he didn't, want, he didn't want to touch any of his livestock. So he took the lamb that belonged to his neighbor and he slaughtered it. And I can imagine, it says King David heard this and he was enraged. And I can imagine he jumps up with this just fury. And he says, as the Lord lives, the man who, di who did this should surely die gets up is convicting himself he's speaking his own death wish how easy is it for us to condemn the people that we hear about when we hear did you hear what so-and-so did i can't believe they did that i hope the righteousness of god comes down and strikes them dead right funny note i remember when i used to work at wells fargo and i used to do new accounts Right? And I remember used, people used to come in all the time, right? Like 50% of my time, would people come in and be like, oh my God, dude, I accidentally overdrew my account, right? Like, you know, th this happened, that happened, everyone's got a story. And I remember just very, very well rehearsed, I would basically say, I am sorry, but we only reverse for bank error. And just refuse them, right? We only can reverse bank fees if it's bank error. It was like a script. But I'll tell you what. Um, and I, I remember because we used to always tease it, like, oh, dude, those this is broke. These guys don't know how to manage their account. They don't know how to balance their checkbook. Balancing a checkbook is something we used to do a long time ago. Um, and the best way to, like, you know, not have any over, overdraft fees on your account are you just don't overdraw your account. But then when I got an overdraft fee, which is very rare, maybe once every 17 to 18 years, um, I would just walk up to my, one of my buddies and say, hey, man, I, I missed something. I have an overdraft fee. Can you take care of it? Oh, yeah, no problem. They just reverse it out right away. I gave myself a lot of grace there, right? But to everybody else, they got righteousness. And I thank God for a God who's more merciful than I am. See, because King David said, kill that man. But God was just like, that doesn't need to happen. That really, that, that, that guy does not deserve to die, you know. And honestly, I love the way that God responds to David because even David, by his own mouth, basically said that I deserve to die. You guys want a great verse? Um, and this is, this is I, I, just, I just love this verse, 2 Samuel 12, 7 and 8. So you have King David who just created this horrific sin before God, right? Took the man's wife, 
impregnated her, and then killed the husband, who was a faithful servant, just to try to cover his own sin, right? And when God basically, you know, kind of sizes him up at the end, what's God's response? I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. So what he's doing, he's basically saying, look at everything that I did for you. Look at everything. Look at the, look at the years. Look at the, the decades that, that I blessed you and I gave you prosperity and I gave you the throne. And you would think that after that, he would be like, how could you? How could you? But no, the very next verse, and had it been too little, I would have also given you much more. And if it had been too little, I would have also given you much more. God's saying, where's your vision? Where's your vision? Where did you go? What happened to you? Right? When did you stop looking to me for satisfaction? When did you stop looking for me to take care of you? When did you start getting distracted by all of that other stuff? I am the one who's more than willing and able to give you everything that you need. And when I read that, I feel convicted because I say when we have these unmet needs, you know, we shouldn't be looking for everything around us to fulfill it, right? The answer is not more money, more possessions, more fame, more this, more stability, more friends, more good time, more going here, more going there. That's never the answer, right? But what we should be doing is we should look to God and say, what should I be doing? God, please fill me. Like, I'm not feeling full right now, but I need you. So I'm going to ask all of us here, I'm going to ask you guys a favor, and I say, don't, let's not drag our bad decisions from 2019 into 2020. Let's not grab, drag our old habits into 2020. We have an opportunity to kind of leave it all behind and to kind of start it all over again. So I want to ask you guys, how was your vision in 2019? How was it? Could you see him? Was God's voice clear to you? Was his hand clear to you? Was it an active partnership in 2019 with him? Or was it a little bit blurry? And I couldn't help but choose vision for 2020, right? The year 2020, come on, guys. That's, let this be our year of vision. Let it be a year where we see clearly, where we're not blurred, so what's your plan for your vision in 2020? You know, and, and my goal, and, and Mark and I and the Abunas will talk about this, but we want to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of this year in this meeting here to discuss this issue of vision. I feel like it's appropriate. 2020. I want our vision this year to be 2020. To be clear, to be precise, to be able. What I love about 2020 is they're not measuring how well do you see what's right in front of you. They said, no, go out. Go out. You got to go out 20 feet. And that's how you know if you have vision. Because I want this to be a church with vision. And you break it down, I want our families to have vision. What good is it to come to church that's fully functioning if your family is broken? We need to be families that have vision. I'll be honest with you. I can't expect you to have a family with a vision unless your marriage has a vision. Because your family will never be healthy if your marriage is not healthy and your marriage needs a vision. And then my goal for 2020 is that when we stand at the end of the year, at the end in, in about 360 days from now, that we look back over 2020 and you'd be like, it was not blurry. It wasn't even blurry a little bit. I was focused, I maintained my vision, and I achieved what I set out for. Sound like a plan? And glory be to God forever, amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, because I know that you have a vision for us, that you have a purpose for us, that you have a calling for us, Lord. And Lord, a lot of the times we don't feel like we're, we're worth it, like we're up to it, Lord. We know our sins and how they burden us, Lord, and how could you ever use someone like me? But Lord, I also know that you are a great God, Lord, and your grace covers that. So, Lord, I ask that you give every single one of us here, Lord, myself especially, just a heart of repentance, Lord, because I know that it's the sin that I choose that separates us. 
And that wall of sin needs to come down. So, Lord, I ask that we start this year with repentance and just a general turning away from the stuff that's holding us down, Lord. And it's funny because we will quickly confess that we hate these sins, that we don't want them in our lives, but then we go back and we choose them again and again and again. But, Lord, I want to go back to the, to the promise that you gave David, and you said that if it wasn't enough, you would have done more. So I ask, Lord, that in all of our lives, Lord, where we have insufficiencies, when we have distractions, when we have temptations, Lord, I ask that you step up and that you just give us more, more of you. Because the more we see of you, the less we need of him. No more temptation, no more Satan, no more tricks of the adversary, Lord. But Lord, I ask that this year be a year of clarity. I ask it be a year of vision. I ask that it be, it be something, Lord, where you just... Let 2020 be a year where you just show up in such an amazing way in this church, but more so in our individual lives. And I ask these things because I know that you're a merciful God who looks towards our repentance with joy. So Lord, I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, that you keep us fixated on you and the cross. Hear these prayers lifted to the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, the Theotokos. All your saints from our tears, here's we pray, thank them in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Christ Jesus,